seated. Please turn to 660 in your hymnal for the call to worship. Now, when I looked at this, I didn't check with anyone, but there are two options, actually, on 660. We will do the one at the top from Mother Teresa. But if you have a chance, read the hymn at the bottom, which is based on Micah chapter 6, verse 8. And it tells us what God requires of us. So let us join in our call to worship, saying together, Make us worthy, Lord, to serve those throughout the world who live and die in poverty or hunger. Give them through our hands this day their daily bread. And by our understanding, love, give peace, and joy. There are youth here, they may be dismissed. A few. As we are doing this summer, if you have prayer requests, we ask that you put them in the basket on the tables in the narthex or gathering area and we will get them on Monday morning, and we will make sure that they come to the right place for prayer, probably on Tuesdays to our prayer gathering. I meet with them every Tuesday, and they pray very sincerely and diligently for anyone whose name or whose concerns come before us. John Hayward is not here this morning. He is away this Sunday, summer Sunday, so I am here. Let us be together as we gather as God's church on this Pentecost Sunday. The weather outside, O oh Lord, is dreary sparkles of rain on the pavement. Not like that first Pentecost, in which you sent the Holy Spirit to fill us with the joy of salvation and the hope that being your children means to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we pray this day in the name of that Spirit of truth. We pray for this congregation and all who are here, whether in the sanctuary itself or listening from home, or for all those who travel because it is summer, or for all those who have drifted away during this time of COVID. Help them, O oh Lord, to find their way back, for none of us can do well without you and with a community of faith. We pray, O oh Lord, for all those of this congregation and friends of this congregation who are struggling in body, mind, and spirit. Be with them and fold them in your loving embrace. Reach out your healing touch, your holy word, and your generous grace as we come before you this day. We are mindful, O oh Lord, of how fractured the world is. It is unlike anything that we have seen in our lifetimes, still recovering from COVID and its variants, and now watching an aggressor nation think they have the right to take over a softer, less, more gentle nation. We pray for our friends and neighbors in the Ukraine. We pray for the Russian people who, it seems, do not want this any more than we do. May your spirit be felt, the spirit of peace, the peace that you leave with us, not as the world leaves, but as you do, for it is filled with hope and with promise and with the encouragement 
to not just sit here, but to do something, if only we pray. When in reality, O oh Lord, anything and everything worth attending to begins and ends in prayer. For we call upon you and your spirit. O oh Lord, we pray for our graduating seniors, for the opportunities that are now open before them. Help them as they make the choices that are in keeping with your will for them and for us. We pray for those whose names we do not know, but who need your healing grace. We don't need to know their names, for you know them all together. We just pray for them, knowing that you understand who we are focusing on and who we are meaning in our prayer. Give us strength, O oh Lord, for the living of these days, with all their uncertainty, all their confusion, all their brokenness. Fill us with the Spirit, O oh Lord, that we may overcome all of that and walk in your ways. And as Micah, your prophet, encouraged us to do, may we love kindness, do justice, and always, always walk with you. Hear us as we pray in your holy name. Amen. Hey, Community Christian Church, it's Reverend Sarah Taylor Beck, and I'm checking in from the Duke Divinity School Chapel. And I'm here starting my summer semester, and it's been wonderful so far. I'm taking a church history class. We're reading Plato and Ambrose and Augustine and talking about the very roots of Christianity and ethical beliefs. I'm also taking a strategy class about how churches can be relevant and engaged in the world we are in now. And we've been studying economics, and we've been studying just the makeup of um, the post-pandemic world and how that's affecting church and community. I just finished meeting with my spiritual director, Dr. Latonya Agard, and she's keeping me accountable about my prayer life and my spiritual journeys on this sabbatical, and we're going to be meeting weekly to just make sure that I'm listening carefully to what God is saying in this time. I miss you, I love you, I'm praying for you, I'm thinking of you, and I'll be studying alongside these um, classes with my cohort at Duke through mid-July, and starting again in August at Duke. And I'm grateful, again, for this time. I miss you, and I love you.
obstacle course this morning. <clears throat> Thank you, Scott, Jackie, and ladies. We appreciate the beautiful music this morning. Today's scripture is from the book of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. This is when Jesus appears to the disciples. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you for this forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. May God add his blessing to the reading of the scripture this morning. that you don't always have two scriptures on a Sunday. But those who put our Bible together use John's Gospel and Luke's Book of Acts. Each one has a different experience of what the coming of the Holy Spirit is like. You may relate to one more than the other. But the text I am reading from Acts 2 is one of those texts that you expect to be read on this day as much as you expect the story of the birth of Jesus from Luke and the story of Mary Magdalene at the tomb, not recognizing the Lord until he spoke her name. Hear now these words from the Gospel, or the Book of Acts, if you will. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonishing and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In their own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you supposed, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. 
No, this is not what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men dream, shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. <clears throat> and I will show portents in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here ends this extraordinary reading from the book of Acts, or the Acts of the Apostles, or as one of my colleagues has written, the Gospel of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Holy God, we come before you this day as we do each week, hungry for your word, thirsty for the good news. So be with us this day as we open our hearts and our minds to hearing this good news that peace will be poured out on all of us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Just for the moment, I want you to try to imagine what it must have been like for those disciples gathered that morning in Jerusalem. The pain of Judas's betrayal was palpable, even though they had chosen Matthias to fill the gap. According to Luke, in this passage from his second volume to his gospel, Jesus appeared to them against any human logic, telling them to go to Jerusalem and there wait. Wait, said Jesus, for the promise of God. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and to the ends of the earth. So they gathered together in Jerusalem just as Jesus had told them to and they waited, waited. Luke is the only gospel writer who included a second volume to his gospel. For what he had written, ending with the road to Emmaus, was not the end of the whole story. According to Luke, the disciples and a handful of women waited in Jerusalem for just what they didn't know, for the power of the Holy Spirit, for sure. But like most of us, they wanted concrete, literal answers to something that would never lend itself to anything as hard as concrete. When would the Spirit come? How would we know? What will it be like? And on and on and on. They toss these questions out into the unfathomable universe. The quiet, silent air over and around them, and they waited, not knowing what to do, how to be, 
only trusting in Jesus' promise. The Father would send the Holy Spirit of God in God's own time. All they could do was wait. Wait. Now they were no better at waiting than we are. Just ask any woman in the eighth or ninth month of her pregnancy, will this baby ever get here? She wants to know with increasing urgency this baby she has been carrying all these weeks is healthy and whole. When the baby finally arrives, this new mother counts all her fingers, all his toes. The waiting in hope and in joyous expectation is over. Her baby is here and grasps hold of life. Sometimes the waiting may be over, but the baby has no strength to grasp hold of life. The waiting ends in grief and sorrow that takes up permanent residence in her heart. Sometimes the waiting is like that of our graduating high school seniors. With graduation, something that began in kindergarten is now complete and a new door is waiting to be opened. Our seniors have been waiting to hear whether they have been admitted to the college of their choice. Every day they haunt the mailbox, waiting for the promise of what either a yes or a no will mean. In either answer, we still believe God is doing a new thing in us Maybe it's a phone call that says, the job is yours. Sometimes we wait, dreading what is to come. Will the diagnosis be negative or positive? Either answer saturated in hope. In the past two and a half years, we have become well-versed in waiting, haven't we? Let's say your mother now in her 90s and on oxygen tests positive for COVID-19 or one of its variants and her symptoms give way to a full-blown case of pneumonia. She hasn't the strength to fight. Then we wait, we wait, we wait as life ebbs. We wait for good news or bad, in hope or in sorrow, and we turn to the God we know in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, and we wait. Like the disciples, we have only the promises of Jesus that God will send to us a paraclete, the helper, the advocate, the comforter, the counselor, the Holy Spirit, of truth. In hope, which means wait, we search for this Holy Spirit. But the mystery is this, we search in vain, for it is the Spirit that finds us. The prophet Isaiah tells us that those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles, they shall run and not be weary. From this moment on, by the power of the Holy Spirit, those gathered in Jerusalem were no longer divided. They were no longer male and female alone. Now they were no longer black or white, gay or straight, young or old, rich or poor, or any of the countless things that divide us. They were no longer divided by the sense of either or, separated because they didn't speak the common language of faith, of oneness in the Lord Jesus Christ. The community of Christ was bound together with ties that could never be undone except by neglect and apathy 
boredom, or chasing after the next bright, shiny object that promises a new revitalized church if only we follow these five steps, these 20 suggestions, this or that new thing that in reality does not really help us embrace the promise of Christ. Luke tells us the Holy Spirit came like gale force winds and no one could tell where it came from. The Spirit came like divided tongues of fire alighting on each of them. There, they spoke at once the language of hope and promise. All were united by this language of heaven. Jan Richardson, in a book of poetry called Circles of Grace, says this in her poem, This Grace That Scorches Us. Here's one thing you must understand about this blessing. It is not for you alone. It is stubborn about this. Do not even try to lay hold of it if you are by yourself thinking you can carry it on your own. To bear this blessing, you must first take yourself to a place where everyone does not look like you or think like you, a place where they do not believe precisely as you believe, where their thoughts and ideas and gestures are not exactly echoes of your own. Bring your sorrow, bring your grief, bring your fear, bring your weariness, your pain, your disgust at how broken the world is, how fractured, how fragmented it is by its fighting, its wars, its hungers, its penchant for power, its ceaseless repetition of the history it refuses to rise above. I will not tell you this blessing will fix all that, but in the place where you have gathered, wait, watch, listen, lay aside your inability to be surprised, your resistance to what you do not understand. See then whether this blessing turns to flame on your tongue, sets you to speaking what you cannot fathom, or opens your ear to a language beyond your imagining that comes as a knowing in your bones, a clarity in your heart that tells you this is the reason we were made for this ache that finally opens us for this struggle, this grace that scorches us toward one another and into the blazing day. For the first time ever, they spoke the language that carries the promise of the gathered community, the church of Jesus Christ. In this story from Luke, the spirit fills the room and the hearts of all those gathered. Never again will we speak the language of division, of hate, of enmity toward another human being. Like the promise of new life for pregnant women in her ninth month, the waiting is over and we embrace the new life made possible by this spirit of truth, this spirit that takes up room within us. God in Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, has gathered us all. I mean this community Christian church in North Canton. Gathered us, get together in order to scatter us to the worlds we live in, uh, to bear witness to the faith we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting in all of his promises to us. We are only able to do this, to be this, when we open our hearts and minds to the Holy Spirit who continually seeks us out, making, up, making it possible for us to speak the language of hope and love, grace and forgiveness. God is waiting. God has opened his own heart to our prayers to our hopes, 
to our gathering. And Jesus has said to us, unless you go, because I promised you the Holy Spirit, unless you go, the word will die. Look around you. They went. The word did not die. The word has been born in this community, in this church, scattered as you are called to scatter and bear witness to the good news we have in Jesus Christ. God willing, may it be so. And the people said, Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome home, weavers. It's so nice to have you here this morning. And I understand you're going to keep coming back. So that's a blessing for us. So thank you. I wore, this is the closest thing I have to red in my closet. I, my mother always said, you're a redhead, you do not wear red. So I did the best I could. This is the moment in the service where we talk about stewardship. And so what's the stewardship mean to you? Well, to me, it represents love. Because we give out of love. We give back to our Lord who has blessed us with countless blessings. And because he first loved us, we give back out of the love that he shared Every morning I do devotions and I have a couple different devotionals that I use, but one is called Turning Point with God from Dr. David Jeremiah. And if you'll bear with me, there's a, a message here on stewardship that I think is appropriate. The scripture was from Joshua. Take careful heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God. When James E. Carter was a pastor of University Baptist Church of Fort Worth, Texas, he shared an experience from younger days that he called the greatest tithing testimony I've ever observed. He said that one day as he waited to see the manager of a grocery store, a widow came in to cash her old age assistance check for $55. The grocer asked how the woman wanted it and she replied, it doesn't make much difference, just so that I have a $5 bill and a 50 cent piece. As the owner gave her the money, Carter noticed that she tucked the coin into the bill, folded it up, and placed it in the corner of her purse. This is my tithe, she explained. I put it separate so I won't spend it on something else. It was a scene Carter never forgot, and it later influenced his own faithfulness in the area of tithes and offerings. That elderly woman didn't have much, yet she honored God with her substance and with the first part of all her income. Stewardship is not merely a matter of obligation. It's a matter of love. When you love someone, you want to express your gratitude and affection. Our stewardship should be faithfully accomplished and lovingly practiced. Are we as wise as that wise old widow? You have to start tithing when you have little if you're going to tithe when you have much. Let us pray. Most gracious and loving God, we do thank you in love for the countless blessings that you pour out on our tables every day. Help us to remember that it all belongs to you and help us to tithe and give back so that your church and your word will continue to flourish on this globe. In all these things we give you thanks in Christ's name. Let us gather around these. 
and then let us go bare and free, carrying the cup, laying the table within a hundred hungry world. This is an open table. This is a table that gathers all of us in our diversity that makes the church a fighting, breathing, fighting reality. All are invited to eat the bread and drink the cup, whether you believe a little or a lot, whether you know the Lord Jesus Christ and have a whole life, or he is new to you, whether you've been baptized or not. You are welcome to take communion here because it is an open table. This is God's table for you. You are all welcome. Elders, let us pray. Dear God, at Pentecost, we give thanks for the church and its survival through the centuries. We break together this communion bread that we may be blessed spiritually May we experience individually the blessing of the Holy Spirit that we may live spirit-filled lives in the week to come. Amen. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this cup, this cup that represents love. Father, as we put this cup to our mouths, help us through it to learn to forgive as you have forgiven to love as you have loved. We thank you in all these things, in these gifts, in Jesus' name. Join us in our final hymn of the morning, number 395, Seed, Scattered and Sown.